welcome everybody. Um, we're really happy to be having you join us for this first in a four part series of what we're calling peer learning sessions around menstrual health education. And just to give you some of your bit of background that a few months ago, we sort of stumbled upon this sort of felt sense that especially when people are working as educators in remote areas with people who are not having ready access to social media, for example, that there's even more of a responsibility and onus on people who are doing education to really, you know, do, deliver um, comprehensive material and, and, and information and do it in a way, obviously, that's really meeting the really special needs of these communities. So with this sort of idea in mind, I hope you can hear our bird in the background, <laughs> can you? We started to just make a racket just as we started. <laughs> anyway, um, music. So yeah, with that in mind, we started actually a few focus group discussions. And this is how our panelists kind of came into the picture is that we reached out to a couple of people who we know and have had long term experience with who were working in this space of menstrual health education. And we had a couple of conversations with you. And that really kind of gave us some important insights, I think, about how to like what were the kind of maybe important questions, what were the challenging topics to unpack and that's how we frame this particular series. So those are people who are joining us and we've had actually about 12 people sign up for this session and we'll be running them every Monday now until for the next four weeks. Um, you've got the schedule, so I won't run through that now, but um, today we wanted to start on at the beginning really, which is how do you start a menstrual health session um, in a new community? So um, yeah, without further ado, I'm just also take a moment to introduce Lauren, if anyone Hello. doesn't know Lauren, <laughs> she's been working with Ecofen the last couple of years, and um, especially taking a very active role on kind of communications and helping supporting building the outreach um, of the um, ambassador work. And we've also got Pranati from Ecofem, who's been involved in helping to organize the um, the program and of course some of you know Hashini from Ecofem from the who's been our really our longest sort of um, ally in education and um, Nelson who I think could also say a few words about himself but we've worked very closely especially in the northeast and he's himself a social entrepreneur and has a cloth pad um, manufacturing unit as well as doing a lot of education in rural communities um, and it's just really always such a pleasure to work with Nelson. So I really am so happy that you could join us and thank you for that. And Angana is also somebody who I just adore. I got to know Angana, gosh, was must have been nearly nine years ago, I'm thinking. And um, we kind of, you know, fell into each other's lives through a project that we were doing in rural um, Uttar Pradesh. And Angana was sort of brought on board as the translation translator for the project, but it became immediately obvious that she had just, you know, many talents that exceeded translation, which she did very well. But in addition, um, I think it ignited a passion in her for menstrual health education. And she's been very much um, carrying that sort of um, torch forward in her own work with the project that she's um, um, a director of, which is Project Kel in Lucknow. Um, so, you know, I'm thrilled to have both of you on the call, as well as Hashini, who has been part of our founding educational team at ECOFEM to help um, get the ECO Third Pad, Pad program up and running. Um, and, you know, she's not been able to leave us. We continue to have her kind of consult with us and do um, local sessions. And she's as passionate. I think what I love about the three um, panelists today is just your, you know, pure passion for this work and um, curiosity to really keep learning and keep discovering and your generosity and sharing your learnings with us and others. Um, I can see also I've worked also with Mumta who's on the call and Swastika and Subalakshmi um, are also part of our ambassador network. So welcome to you all. We wanted to just ask if you could all please if possible 
have your videos on. It's just so nice to see people. Um, happy if it's like your decision, if you don't want to, if you have bandwidth issues, it's fine. But if you can show us your beautiful faces, it just makes it all the more interesting to interact with you. Um, and yeah, of course, just the usual protocols around muting if you're not speaking and ideally keeping your phones or other interrupting devices on Children. silence. <laughs> no, no, no. I have a child. Speaking as a mum. <laughs> Yeah, so welcome to our first in this peer learning um, community that we're really hoping to build with each of you um, as part of it. And I'm not going to continue to talk now, but um, maybe we'll say things in between. But I'm going to um, hand over first to Nelson to get us started today. And so we'd like to have for you to give us a you know, just a few minutes sort of explanation about, because this, I, the topic for today, I should probably just in the beginning is preparing to conduct menstrual health education sessions, especially if you're doing it for the first time. So if you could help walk us through what you think the basics are, like when you're getting started, what do you need to know? Um, what needs to be in place in order to enter a new community? Um, yeah, how do you go about it? Like if someone would be studying this for the first time, how should they, what should they be thinking about? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Kathy and the Ecofem team for having me here as a, a panelist. It's such a pleasure to always work with the Ecofem team. Uh, so I am Nelson and I have been working in the MHM space uh, since the last eight years uh, in the Northeast of India, uh, in the state of Assam. And we also have been covering the neighboring states like Arunachal, Nagaland, Meghalaya, uh yeah mostly these three states so uh we actually started with uh, a pad production unit uh, we were doing disposable pads um and that was the stage when i was just learning about menstrual health learning about conducting awareness and education and when i started in 2012 in the northeast i would say we were the pioneers of you know doing menstrual health uh, maybe uh, products or uh, sessions or education or anything as such and it was extremely difficult for a man to kind of you know get into that space and talk about something that is so uh, personal to a woman's life so i've gone through my phase of struggle and you know but it's been an amazing journey so far and uh, lately i think uh, two years ago uh, you know, we started with uh, cloth pads, but uh, recently, I think uh, a year and a half ago, we were funded by the government of India uh, with Ecofem uh, to kind of start our own production unit uh, to, you know, produce a reusable cloth. And I should say this at the beginning that we've uh, sent our first cloth pad to the US uh, recently last week. So it's a huge achievement for us, I think. So uh, in our small capacity, you know, we're trying to uh, do as much as possible. So uh, when we actually approach a new community, what we do is uh, we have tea tribes in Assam, we have the hill tribes, we have so many tribes. So we actually need to know, uh, you know, the whole geography, uh, you know, the, the whole culture that they live in, their practices, uh, how many menstruating women, how many adolescent girls, how many households, uh, you know, what products do they use? Uh, so we usually conduct surveys uh, before actually intervening into a community. Uh, we talk to the uh, ASHA, that is Accredited Social Health Activists, or Anganwadis. We take their help to reach out to the communities. And uh, we meet community resource people who have a lot of data about, you know, the women and girls. Uh, so what we do is we uh, generally do a survey with the help of the ASHA or the Anganwadi and uh, find out we have a set of questions. So, you know, we get these answers from them, then study that and then call for a meeting where we call, uh, you know, some school teachers, maybe uh, some social activists, some students, some uh, people who are interested in social work. We have a meeting with them and we talk and we say who we are and what we want to do. Uh, and then we find out from them, you know, uh, 
have they had these sessions before? Uh, if then what, who has conducted these? What is the kind of information that they've received? Because, uh, you know, we find a lot of, let's say the government also coming in and just propagating about sanitary pads and, you know, saying cloth is bad, you should use it. So there's this huge culture uh, in the rural settings where a lot of men girls feel that cloth is actually unhygienic. So we need to learn what they think and then, you know, approach them. Uh, we need to learn what languages they speak. Sometimes, you know, they have their local dialects and we don't know that dialect. So we take help from a resource, for, uh, from a community member who's willing to, you know, help us translate. Um, we make sure, you know, if we can, you know, take a projector, if we can screen something, if there is a community resource center that we can use. Uh, we also find out if there are panchayats or any who also is aware of such intervention, who can also come there and tell the community that, you know, uh, this is something that the community wishes to do. So, you know, for an individual or for a new organization to just go into a community and talk to people, people don't know you. But when the community leaders are there in your first meeting and they introduce you and they say, hey, these guys are here to do something for you and for your betterment, then they take it more um, you know, importantly and they give you that time. And uh, I think uh, we also have to be very uh, 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 particular about being respectful to, uh, to you know, who we are dealing with. Because uh, sometimes what happens is, you know, uh, they have told us that there are a lot of organizations who come and they say, this is what you need to do. And this is what you're doing wrong. And, you know, they feel very offended or they feel that, you know, probably they are not very literate or they don't know. So we don't want our community to feel that way. So we just have to make sure that we, le we learn what they do, but we are not here to really tell them that, hey, this is wrong, and you have been practicing something which is not right. But to give them a, a, a view of what this is, and then, you know, uh, you decide, and we are here to help you take decisions. So what happens is they feel that, okay, um, so they decide if they've been doing something wrong, or if they've been practicing something that is wrong, because, you know, there are a lot of NGOs now who say that, you know, uh, this is stigma, this is myth, this is a taboo, and, you know, it's okay. I mean, you can go into the kitchen and you can probably go into the puja room and all of that. But these practices, they've been practicing for days. For someone to go in and tell them, hey, this is wrong. They feel like you are an outsider. What do you know about our culture? And there wasn't anything wrong for us to practice. Nobody has been harmed or, you know, so... So yeah, I mean, acknowledging what they've been doing, but also giving them an, a clear view, okay, but you know, uh, but why? Why do we need to do this? You know, so when they understand that, then I think they become more uh, empowered uh, to take decisions. So I think that's one of the first few things that we do. We we catch hold of we catch hold of community leaders, ashas, anganwadis. Uh, have uh, uh, call the uh, panchayats or the leaders. Uh, do a little survey, find out what are what are the products that we use. Uh, then it becomes a little easy for us to work with those communities. Thanks, Nelson. I think that's a great sort of kicking off point in terms of just some of the, the sort of things that need to be sort of navigated before you even get the women and, and girls in the room. Maybe from that point on, then I would like to, I think I'd like to ask Angana to continue. So, um, and, and again, if there are questions coming up, perhaps you could just take note and hold them for now. We'll pop them in a chat box if you want, and we'll come to them at the end. But I'd like to sort of more or less run through the flow of content before we start engaging questions, if that's okay with people. And I'm going to, if you could um, pick up from where Nelson has um, 
been speaking to once you've got the sort of you've got the room is full of people looking at you expectantly to start the menstrual health education session what do you do how do you start <laughs> um so one I, I just wanted to add a little bit more because uh, Nelson's way of working is slightly different from the way Project Hale works, but we're doing exactly the same thing uh, in terms of the pre-work uh, that we do before a session. Um, so because of bandwidth issues, we've mostly, almost always worked only through partners and we've not directly entered into a community because we've not had that kind of a team size uh, to be able to run a program as specifically. Um, so we generally try to have at least an hour and a half of our sessions and instead of again because of bandwidth issues and lack of um, communication uh, loops that exist between us and the uh, partner organization maybe we spend the first few minutes in doing super fun random activities and uh, songs and dances and games so that we are able to extract the exact same kind of uh, information that Nelson just mentioned in terms of the local words being used and what are the products that you use how much do you know and who else has spoken so all of that we try to uh, get in the first 10 15 minutes and then we customize our intervention again on the spot uh, to be able to like respond to the needs of the community. Uh, so that is one thing. And again, because I'm from Project Kale, Kale means play. So our, our entire packaging of the program is very playful. And we have lots of singing and dancing and stories uh, that we inject into our curriculum so that a sense of a safe space is created and one important thing I'd like to mention here is that when we started out uh, in 2013, so 2012, we helped uh, Kathy uh, to facilitate a workshop. By 2013, we felt we were ready to actually start our own workshops in Lucknow. And we started, but today we're going to talk about something very important and it is very important for you, uh, for you and not many people will ever tell you about this. So we created this entire um build up on why our session is important and why this particular intervention is different from what we've done with our children so far and we thought we were doing the right thing but it was just a horrible session like horrible in the sense that we did deliver everything we wanted to but because we had created such a strong build up most of our girls got scared and uh, they are the same girls who had initially picked up on sensitive information delivered through games and stuff in our previous interventions. But for that particular one, even the smartest ones could not answer any of the questions which were related to the information we had shared during the, uh, the workshop. So, so uh, within the first five, six months, we realized that this is what is continuously happening across all our interventions related to menstruation, that we're creating this buildup. Um, so what we figured eventually, what we started experimenting with is, is to ease up the session, to let the girls get into that space. They have this sense of understanding that this is a safe space because again, uh, a teacher-student relationship or an educator-student relationship in uh, the kind of places we've worked in are not that great. Like uh, Most teachers that uh, most of our children know are the ones who would like to finish their job and go back home and not really be there to create that space where it is about the child. It's not about me or it's not about me ticking off what is there on my list of to-dos. So um, by not talking about periods directly, by starting out with uh, fun games, we've helped uh, our group open up into that space, have this sense of uh, trust in the first few minutes, and then we just jump into the content. So our language is very blunt and it is fun. It is also lame sometimes, like it is not a very literal sort of a language that we are using uh, with uh, our participants. So that has been really helpful in helping children understand it is their space and we are not teachers because again um, it is very important for us educators menstrual educators to understand the associations that our participants are making with us maybe uh, based on our class or our or what we are looking like or our language so right now if i'm talking about a educator and participant relationship it's like a teacher student relationship which is not the most positive uh, association that kids can make so yeah so so that's something 
Thank you, Angina. Um, I really love that you sort of also bring in this aspect of that there are different approaches, I think, depending on how your organisation is structured and what its existing relationship is with the community. So obviously there's, um, you know, that's part of it. And um, <laughs> yeah, I think that I'd love to hear if you could just give us maybe one example, perhaps, of when you actually, like how you kind of warm up the group any sort of example of, of an, an, an actual thing that you do in you the can do it with us <laughs> we'll, we'll all jump in <laughs> so again it depends on uh, the vibes so again we believe a lot in the vibes we are feeling after we enter a space so we always try to enter at least a few minutes like at least 20 minutes before the start of the session and just quietly see what's happening what's the environment like what is the vibe that we are feeling and based on that we choose something to do so generally what uh, for most of the sessions that i facilitate what i start up with, uh, start out with is uh, acha so all of you are school going or else uh, you all are big girls now so i'm sure you'll know about your body so tell me uh, how many openings do we have in our body if we count both nostrils as two and then they start counting and Obviously, they do not talk about the vagina or uh, all of that. Okay. So, uh, when, okay, and then to lead that forward. So, what else comes out of our body? No, we start with what do you take inside your body? What are the things that you consume? So, they make a whole list of all the different kinds of foods and fruits and vegetables they have. And for every answer, we appreciate them. Very good answer. Yes, clap for yourselves. So, there's this sense of, yes, I have something to contribute in a class. So, this the class automatically becomes something positive because they're being appreciated for their uh, inputs. And then the next question is, so all the things that are going out into your body, what are the different things that come out of your body? And that is when this whole list starts. We sweat and we throw up and then we, we pee and then we poop and then we fart. You know, all kinds of answers start coming in. What else are you missing out? And that is when this, the giggles start. And we giggle along with them because... Again, the thing is, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't giggle and nothing to be ashamed of. So these are stuff that we know because we are in a privileged position. We have better self worth better understanding of our bodies and all. And it's not fair to tell a bunch of girls who've never been spoken so positively about their body that, no, no, you shouldn't giggle. Yes, please giggle. It is something funny. Let's laugh at this. And so automatically the giggle then instead of being associated with shame and shamefulness, it gets associated with something positive because the teacher is also laughing with us. And then we say, I know why you're laughing. I know you're laughing because you know the answer. And that is when we start picking on individual expressions or certain words that might be coming out and, and kind of knit that through the flow. Like, why did you giggle? And then there's this, this whole stand-up comedy, humorous sort of a thing that happens. So no one feels targeted, but then it's also something that we're laughing and talking, talking and gently just you know, swimming into this entire period's conversation. Thank you. Um, last quick question before I, I pass over to Hashini. Um, you mentioned then the teachers. So it sounds like you have the class teacher always present in the room. Maybe you could just speak to that, like the advantages and disadvantages of having teachers present. And um, even whether you do sort of single gender classes or mixed or just, yeah, just a little bit on that. Hmm. Uh, so for the teachers, again, we try to get a sense of the kind of organization we are working with, because um, in the last few years, a lot of money is flowing into the menstruation space. So a lot of people want to work on periods or want to have conversations uh, on periods and uh, without really feeling for the cause. So sometimes when we just know through our initial conversation that a certain partner is not invested in a cause and it might just be because someone else has asked them or some donor has requested them for it so in those cases we do not encourage teachers to be in the room but if they want to it's okay and uh, again we also choose between uh, based on the comfort level of a facilitator so uh, i've been working as a facilitator since 2012, so I'm very, very confident about holding my own space. So at this point, it does not matter to me who else is in my room. Because if there's someone who's speaking out of turn, I can very respectfully ask that person not to. But uh, when newer facilitators are coming in, at that point, either I am 
a hyperactive support facilitator or else we just ask the teacher it's okay if you do not join let the girls be comfortable so these are individual choices we need to make based on the confidence level a facilitator is feeling because organizationally our stand is that yes teacher should be there because they also belong to the same community who would benefit from the conversation but again the flip side of it is that with a teacher there is an existing image that uh, the girls would want to maintain so they might not want to use certain words or laugh at a few things or feel comfortable discussing a few things so in that case it has to be an honest reflection that a facilitator needs to make that do i have it in me to kind of put that teacher out of of this circle of trust i'm creating with my girls for the next two hours or am i also going to get uncomfortable based on the body language or the vibes this particular teacher is giving out so i think this needs to be on a case to case basis um yeah and uh, in terms of the uh, mixed gender groups yeah. uh, so so far uh, we have done some mixed gender workshops but they've only been with our senior most children and that also we started out by talking to boys separately girls separately we spoken about sex and breakups and relationships going out on dates and online dating and all and kind of had a lot of uh, conversations in the peripheries and once we knew that both girls and boys are going to be comfortable we brought them together uh, so uh, generally we try to have separate sessions for girls and separate ones for boys because we felt that uh, of course both gender need to know about it but we also need to acknowledge the backgrounds they are coming from just because i believe that there should be mixed gender groups it's absolutely unfair to have a bunch of boys and girls who are going to go back to the same community and i am going to step out of that community because i don't live there it's not fair to put them in that position of awkwardness mm. so we with the girls separately boys separately then depending upon what it is feeling like what the conversations are feeling like then maybe we do a closing session together in which we are also singing and dancing on periods but then by then there's also a relationship created with the girls separately with the boys separately both the genders have become comfortable talking about the topic being in a room where the topic is being discussed and then we bring them together mm, excellent thank you okay um hashini over to you if you could just walk us through what you think are the key topics or messages that should be part of an introductory menstrual health session and yeah how do you go about yes um just before i go into that i want to add one more small thing to what uh, nelson uh, and angana mentioned like i before going into and working especially like as uh, ecofemi work directly with a lot of schools so uh, one of the pre uh, preparations that uh, i would recommend to do with when you work with schools is also that uh to find out their uh, facilities the bathroom facilities their, whether the bathrooms has dustbins and things like that before i go ahead and say like oh you wrap the pad and throw it in the dustbin i think as a facilitator you need to know whether there's a dustbin in the school what is the disposal system who is picking it up whether there's an incinerator and things like that so that is like one more small thing to add to the list of preparations to do about knowing the facilities in the school and uh, also whether the school is distributing uh, free napkins and um, disposable government scheme napkins and things like that because then it might be like the majority of the girls will be using disposable napkins given by the school so then you have to just keep that in mind uh yeah uh, going to what are the the flow of the session um um uh, find ice breaker is one of the major uh, really important um, uh, entry uh because you're standing in front of them that makes as angana rightly mentioned that makes an image of whether you're standing in front like as a teacher or a facilitator or this like just this uh elder sister who is there to speak with them and uh build this rapport and they can speak anything about uh, anything uh about anything to us you know like to open up that space uh so we start with the ice breaker and uh, one of the first uh, the next things is like the changes in the body because i feel that uh, is kind of a problem yo my voice is breaking no it was sorry it was slightly soft we were straining a bit to hear you um but it's i was just it, looking for the volume button that's why i'm like <laughs> <laughs> it's okay okay But I mean, is it for everybody? Like, is it soft for everybody, or just Kathy and Lauren? It's fine now. A while back, we're just losing you. Right now, you sound okay. Yeah. 
Okay, okay. Yes, so I find it quite um, like interesting to ease into the topic with uh, the changes in the body. So what, what are the changes in your body, you know, like uh, just like, uh, and they start talking about their pimple, they start talking about like the growing breasts and like, uh, and the hair and things like that. So puberty is uh, one of the first things that we start speaking in the session. And then I also find it quite interesting when you directly ask the girls like, hey, what are your body changes? Uh, they kind of like are like shying and then they're like, okay, what are the body changes for boys? And they're like, duh, duh, duh. like they have mustache, they have beard, and their voices break and things like so. And then, it, no, it's like, in a way, like I find it quite uh, interesting to ask about the other gender. To, they're like, chuck, chuck, the, they answer very quickly. And about them, they're like, this is, a, and then, you know, like, hey, now, okay, come on, tell about yourself. And you just ease into that uh, uh, space. So um, changes in the body in puberty is one of the first things, like easing. And then when it comes to, as uh, I'm going to mention, like when it comes to blood and, uh, okay, what is, why is this blood coming from the body? So that, that question is kind of answered with uh, what is menstruation, the anatomy, what is the reproductive system, like how does it look? And uh, um, so we use these interactive materials, which we can pass around. So with Ecofem, we have a crocheted uterus which you can like, which is small, which you can like squish and pass around and keep on your body. Um, one um, very powerful thing that um, um, I find uh, doing um, is that uh, touching their body. So do, I think I picked it up from Angana. Uh, like, where is your uh, uterus? So, I mean, uh, she like one uh, fist below your belly button. Uh, so I was like, oh, do you all have belly buttons? And then they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you go ahead and ask them to touch. Like you make a triangle under their uh, one fist below their belly button. So I, personally, I feel that exercise very powerful um, when when they touch the bodies. And and to just add uh, to that uh, at that point, like it's okay, you know, it's okay, you know, uh, to touch your own body. Um, and from there on, like okay, what is uterus and what is the um, anatomy? What's what's his uterus doing? And um, for younger girls, um, um, I feel it's easy, uh, it's nicer to relate uh, to the topic as like, okay, what is digestive system? What every, like, you know, like, uh, what does the heart do? In that way, what is this um, uh, reproductive system and what is the, what is the function of the reproductive system in the body? I find this conversation this way as like normalizing, uh, this is also a re uh, organ. And this is the function of the organ, no? And then we say like, okay, the explain what is happening uh, during menstruation. Uh, and then uh, different stages of menstruation. So the ovulation, the pre-menstruation and menstruation. So you go and uh, related to the moon and uh, different cycles of a flower and uh, from a bud to a flower, things like that. And um, cycle tracking, the next one would be cycle tracking. So, um, okay, when you go around the stages of menstruation, so the next topic would be uh, how to track each of it and the numbers. And this point, we, we uh, emphasize a lot on tracking and noting your uh, cycle. So along with uh, the girls, we also take the, our own examples and do a cycle, like a physical cycle tra tracking activity. Uh, and in terms of like little urban schools or when we do women who we see that who have access for cell phones and all, so we recommend them to do the cycle tracking in the app. Um, and we like more and more, like at least in this area we, where we work, uh, we find it quite common uh, as women like uh, having a smartphone. So like that also like, also, and, and in the room we ask how many of you generally track the cycle. And so it, it's, a, it's a good conversation. And when you do, with, do it with the girls, so, and you ask them to um, um, continue doing it. Um, so there's also uh, girls who have not had their period will uh, kind of do it uh, along with their friends so that when they start their period, they would know. Uh, and uh, within, uh, along with the same conversation, we also go into, what's normal and what's abnormal about the period like can you bleed for nine days straight can you uh, not have your period for 60 days so it's like so this is a uh, segue for us to talk about what's uh, normal and what's not and what where to seek help. Oh, sorry uh, what is the um, 
yeah, so it's normal and normal and when to seek help and where. So this is also important when you uh, do your uh, preliminary studies to know whether the, the, they have a PHC, whether it's a female, female doctor in the PHC, or what is the nearby hospital that they need to go, and is there a gynecologist there? So all these uh, information would be necessary for you to have in your hands so that uh, we can tell if there is a problem, where, can, where they can sort help. And the, again, this is where it's interesting also to have the teachers in the room because for them, uh, so that the girls can address like if something like this happens, like uh, can they speak to the teacher to understand what's normal and what's not. But um, as uh, Angana rightly mentioned, it's it's like uh, it's like the dynamics is different between each school. Sometimes the teachers are okay. Sometimes they're not. Uh, the the way the kids express is really um, that's kind of like very important to us than uh, making the teacher feel comfortable in the class. You know, like so it's really uh, important. You can make the judgment there. Uh, and the next uh, would be uh, how to take care of yourself. Uh, so in terms of um, nutrition and uh, pain elevation, I find personally fine when we talk to girls, uh, nutrition is like, we want to talk about nutrition, but they don't want to hear about it a lot. Uh, so pain elevation is kind of like really uh, take some time and uh, speak about more practical uh, things that they can do to themselves. And this is like with uh, household items and things. Uh, and also like be more conscious about what um, the the nature can offer in terms of like the local herbs and things like that, which uh, again, this can also be a part of the preliminary studies that we do about like what is the natural pain elevation um, methods that the locals use there. So we can address that. And that actually also comes from the girls in general, like, oh, this is what we do, this is what we don't do. And again, there are some uh, red flags that we often hear in, in this region uh, um, where we work, we often hear that you can drink soda to elevate your pain. And we're like, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like you would hear also, it's like, and then uh, how we kind of address it is that like, okay, how many of you have had soda? How many, for how many of you has it helped and not? So it's interesting to uh, see that uh, dynamics also. And uh, we start slowly are starting to hear about pills, taking pills, whether pills are right or wrong for pain elevation. So again, like that is, um, uh, it puts us in a situation to say what's good and what's not. So we kind of like go, okay, if it's very necessary and if your pain is intolerable, you can go ahead, but see to that that you don't make it a habit, you know? Um, so we just give that judgment to them. And uh, nutrition, I find it really important to speak about this piece. Um, as we all know, and we, as we work in this field, we know the anemia rates. Um, so, and I also find it very important for us to know the local herbs and local uh, green leaves that they can uh, have instead of, uh, I always find it very, very um, funny to mention like, oh, you can eat dates and almonds and uh, for, so it's like, I don't think it's practical at all to uh, go to marginalized um, uh, communities and talk about all these hi-fi uh, things. So I, one of the common things that we use is like drumstick leaves here, which is like in the villages, every alternate house has drumstick leaf trees here. So, and then I think in the urban areas, we can put reference to like the greens available and how often they should be eating and things like that. And how important it's to have a vitamin C together uh, for absorption. Um, and then we go to the different uh, product options available and uh, do um, analysis of uh, or the cost of each the each of the product. How what is the um, environmental impact? What's the impact on your body? What's in each product, and um, how long they last, and all these uh, like detailed analysis for all the products. And um, make sure you include like the latest products. Also, for example, the, one of the recent inclusions is this, the period underwear, and I even commonly see that there's advertisement in YouTube for period underwear these days. So it's important to cover, like keep yourselves updated of all the look of products available and uh, um, speak to them about all the options available in the market along with the prices. 
Um, and uh, so at the uh, so we're coming to the nearing to the end of the session. Uh, so here's where like all throughout the session, the girls and the women like constantly ask about these practices, the cultural practices, whether we can go to the temple or not go to the temple. You know, like trying to put us in this situation. Uh, as Nelson also um, uh, Nelson rightly mentioned, like we are not there to say like you do this, you don't do this, like this is. And we're not there to call their ancestors fools by telling, okay, we don't know why we why they told so, but we don't need to follow. We're these modern women here, so it's really um, like a thin ice that uh, I always find myself in a very delicate situation when those questions arise. Um, so from my experience, it's actually like quite interesting to I do this Chinese whisper game uh, with the girls and uh, give a, a long statement of like something like um, in, I do like a Kurukural, which is one of the like a two line poem in uh, Tam poem, like, oh, yeah, um, in Tamar. So and then it comes out as like just one word or like totally twisted. So kind of use that experience as like a lot of these um, practices that uh, uh, that we follow these days uh, came with like a lot of knowledge those days and it came with some scientific reason behind it but now the way that we practice it is very on on the surface just do this or not do this not without the reasoning behind it so and then we we walk on like a little bit uh, certain things that for us which we find it very unsafe like uh, to classify the um, practices as safe and unsafe and to what we find one of the reasons uh, one of the things that we find unsafe is uh, drying the pads uh, in indoors you know like not indoors like when there's no light or in total like hiding the pads so that is something that we address and say like it's like you need to dry your pads outside you know under the sun uh, and maybe give some tips about like how you still can it it can be under the sun but still it can be a little bit discreet that uh, people don't know that it's a bad help. Um, so, so I find the cultural addressing that is really important, but not to go very, very deeply into it because at first, like the time constraints, we don't have all. Uh, especially when you work with schools, we do not have a lot of time, and uh, that also really builds on our reputation to go back again and again and have this relationship with the school. So it is uh, really very important that we touch and uh, we, we, we uh, say our view about like this, like you're not here to say what's good and bad, but please make the choice yourself, but still to really address the unsafe practices and not to forget to address the unsafe practices. Um, yes, that's about uh, the flow of the session that uh, generally I follow. Thanks, Sashini. That was great. Gave a really um, clear overview. It'll take a lot of time. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I'm, just, I'm sort of watching the time, but um, yeah, we might move on. But again, we're going to have a more extensive Q&A, I hope. So that um, will give us a chance to maybe unpack anything that's still maybe hanging in people's minds. Before we open up for Q&A, I'd like to just um, invite any of the panelists to just speak a little bit to anything that hasn't been said in terms of what you think uh, um, yeah, like best practices or some of your hot tips <laughs> to help anyone who's maybe, you know, trying to sort of get into this sort of work. If there is anything that hasn't been said, but you think is really important that you would like to convey as, as a best practice. And in a way, we haven't touched the question, but maybe you could, some of you could weave this in around um, also the dip, working with different audiences. I think we've tended to talk more about working with schoolgirls because I know that's the group that Angana is primarily working with and, and Hashini, you've worked mostly with girls too. We've also worked with women, a little bit with boys and men. Um, Nelson, you've probably had more experience in this. So I think that's maybe another question if you could just speak to any of your thoughts on, you know, like hot tips, including how to sort of work with different populations um, and before we open up for Q&A we'll maybe have about 10-15 minutes for, for that. Is that okay? mm -hmm. So anyone can sort of jump in. <laughs> Nelson. So shall I just uh, quickly say some points? I think um, uh, I think for a facilitator it's so important that we do our homework, we know the topic inside out 
because I think Angana had said that there's now so much of cash flowing in into the space and everybody wants to do work in the menstrual hygiene space. So we've seen a boom like after the Fat Man movie, I think. And uh, I have come across a lot of people who just talk about sanitary pads and they think this is just the solution. And they're very happy just sponsoring and distributing sanitary pads. And I've, I've heard some of these sessions which are so not right. Uh, and it's so important with who are you dealing with? You know, sometimes we have sessions with corporates and people who are, you know, recently on International Women's Day, we had a lot of women from the corporate sector, doctors and a lot of women, you know. So it's, it's so good that we do our homework. And if we don't know something, it's best that we say we don't know and we can find out and get back to you. I think this is what I once learned from Kathy. She had told me once, it's not that you have to know everything all the time. Uh, we're also learning in the process. So it's best that we give the right information. And uh, if not, then we just don't, we say we don't know. Uh, and the rest, uh, I think, uh, you know, shall I also just mention about how we work with men and boys, Kathy? Yeah, okay, all right. So uh, with men and boys, you know, what we've been doing is we, when we go to a lot of schools, some schools ask us that, why is this session only for women? I mean, only for girls. Why can't the boys get involved? So we are very happy, like, you know, uh, because we have different projects. Sometimes we are collaborating with bigger organizations like Rotary International. Sometimes, you know, we're individually going in and doing work. Sometimes we are collaborating with some other funders or whatever. So it is very clear when we uh, get a project that we, uh, when we get a project, they come with certain terms and conditions and this is what they want to do. And their homework is really not very good. So we can definitely tell them that this is how we want the program to be like. And I've seen in my personal experience that, you know, when we say this is what we want, they are always willing to incorporate that. Uh, we cannot blame them because they don't know how these sessions are done. So it's always good that we give in our input and create a flow of how you want the sessions to be. So sometimes, uh, as I think uh, Angana had mentioned, that we do different genders separately. And in some schools, they say we want them to be together. So if it is together, then of course, there's a lot of you know bars and the boys are always laughing. Uh, we have, after sessions, uh, the teachers have told us that you've done such a great help to us because we've come across this in a lot of schools where teachers find it extremely difficult to talk about the reproductive uh, you know, system and the whole menstrual cycle. They tell us that boys who don't talk during the other chapters, they become very active during those sessions and they you know, ask very like, you know, questions, which is okay from their point of view, but it's very uncomfortable for the teacher to answer. So as Angana also said that we are not teachers, we are facilitators. Harshini also said that maybe we are younger sisters or uh, elder sisters, brothers, whoever. So we can also giggle with them. We can also laugh with them. Uh, so when we're doing it together, we just make sure that the boys get uh, to ask questions later and the girls get everything sorted first. But when we're doing with boys only session, uh, we actually do a body mapping with them. So we talk about, you know, their issues and, you know, erection and nightfall and all other things. And then we say, okay, hey, but we're talking about you. Now, what do you think is a woman's body? How does that function? So, you know, how does that look? What are the changes that come? And then it's so easy for us to actually go into the reproductive organs and then, you know, tell them, okay, this is what really happens. These are the ovaries. And uh, we have so much of uh, resources available, like uh, the uterus that uh, Ecofame has created, the, the small kit. Uh, we also have presentations that we have made. So I think when we talk and give them that space, you won't believe there are so many questions that come up, which is probably out of the space, you know? but we have to answer them because they feel that they've never got the space to ask these questions. And we say that no question is stupid or, you know, you can just ask anything. And there they feel, hey, like, so we can just ask anything. 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's how we get into the whole process. And then uh, we ask them, how can you be allies? How can you be stakeholders? How can you actually help? Uh, have you ever bought pets for women in your life? Uh, so, you know, that's how we make the whole space comfortable. And uh, we have to answer to their questions. Either it's stupid, either it's scientific, either it's whatever baseless, but we have to answer them. We have to make sure that that time that we got with them, we just give them the right information. Uh, as Harshini said that, you know, it's so important that uh, we have such limited time and there's so much that we need to do. We make sure that we give them our contact details. We give them, uh, you know, our social media links. And I, we ask them that if you're more interested, you can visit us or you can call us, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's not necessary that we have to do these sessions in schools and colleges. That could be the introductory session. But then later on, they can always form smaller groups and reach us, you know, to have these sessions. So, yeah, we don't get too much into the topic, but we just make sure they know what is really happening in the women's bodies and how does it happen? What is coming out? Where is it coming out from? Uh, what are the products that are available? Uh, how do they need to be disposed? Uh, how is it creating uh, environment pollution, et cetera? Uh, what are the costs? Who's making it? So yeah, I think uh, that way, uh, they just feel that they've gotten anyways a lot of information. Yeah. I'm gonna... Yeah, I wanted to build on a few points that Nelson shared. Uh, we follow a very similar uh, flow when it comes to working with boys. Um, so one thing we've understood is that for girls, it makes more sense. They have a need to understand about their periods. For boys, it's not about them. Periods are not about them. So how do we sell that topic to them in a manner that they would want to engage with the content? So we've had a very, very similar flow as uh, Nelson shared that we start talking about the body puberty and with puberty, yes, nightfall, and then uh, pornography, masturbation, safe sex, all of that. When we start talking about sex, we go into con uh, consent. And then from consent, we enter the entire discussion on our periods. And uh, one hot tip that I wanted to share as an add-on to this is uh, it's extremely important that as an organization or as an individual, we should not and cannot have this mindset that we are menstrual educators, like we are here to talk about periods. It is just spreading out the entire cause too thin and not giving due credit to the experiences of different groups of people across ages and across genders also. So, um, for, uh, I'll, I'll take Project Hale's example. When we work with young girls, it is out and out about attitude management. And that is something that we uh, figured out after a couple of years of working, that we were not the only ones talking about periods. We might be the more fun people talking about periods, but in terms of impact, we were as bad as anyone else who was just doing presentations. And wh why was that happening? So asking these why-based questions help us understand that there is so much shame that you associate with your body. There is so much a young girl is made to feel guilty about in a place like UP because... She has dirty blood coming out of her body. And, and even if there's no one who's told a young girl that your period blood is dirty, there are a million people in her life who's told her that, no, you have, you cannot spread your shoulder out. Like you have to be slouched down and you need to look down. You can't laugh loudly. You can't wear sleeveless. You can't wear a skirt. So these kind of restrictions also have a very strong impact on how a girl is viewing herself and what she wants to do about her body and what she would want to know about her body. So after, so it's important that we also try to understand and kind of give these girls comfort that yes, we are with you. We've had a similar journey. We've had a similar struggle. It's not like I was born with everyone telling me, yes, you're the best and you deserve everything. So then there's this connection of struggle that we are able to build. And uh, then it becomes about attitude management. When we are working with women, uh, mostly we would prefer working with mothers and maybe young mother-in-laws. And with them, our entire focus is, it, it's a very emotional session that we run with them. Of course, we do have games and songs and dancing all involved in this as well. But the focus is a lot on 
helping women to take a stand for themselves that they would want to break this circle of violence they have it, we, we we invest a lot in helping in reminding women how did they feel as a new daughter in law in the house when their uh, mother in law made them on, uh, do certain things or or did not allow them to do certain things and then bring in this angle of empathy that why do you want to be that person do you so you know how you felt about your mother in law are you comfortable knowing that just by emulating everything your mother in law has told you your grandmother has done to you or told you you are being you are that person who is being hated by this young girl in your family do you want to be that person you know asking these kind of reflective questions and again because one overarching theme is also empowerment empowerment means that you take informed decisions so this is a decision for you to take if you think you're comfortable being that person please go go ahead and be as violent as you want with periods that's not for us to say but if you don't what can you change and you don't need to give that answer to us because a lot of times maybe 10 out of 10 women in a room have completely agreed they're on board with what we are discussing but then there's also this social baggage that we carry of what we look like what we are perceived like that they might not want to express themselves uh very honestly in a in a group because they know that my neighbor is related to me or my neighbor is very good friends with my mother in law and it will ruin stuff so instead of encouraging for a whole lot of discussion we just ask them certain questions and ask them to think about that and decide for themselves what are the small changes they want to make in their lives and then of course we leave some space for uh, one on one discussions if anyone wants to ask certain pressing questions that they were not able to ask in the group and when we are working with boys with boys uh, our focus is on building empathy uh, for women and uh, the experiences that girls have young girls have and also understanding how patriarchy functions in the society and therefore we need to absolutely acknowledge that men in most cases have the spending capacity in most families even if the women is a uh, women are earning the money goes to the husband and the husband decides uh, what amount is spent on what so it is important that we acknowledge this aspect of patriarchy and also know that it's going to take years before patriarchy is out of the country out of the society so it's better that we talk also in terms of money to boys for them to understand the cost of periods be it about like taking the right choices right now or the amount you might need to spend when your when the woman in your house is sick she is unwell because of the wrong choices that she is made with her period products so building on these two like empathy and the economics of periods we we found um, a lot more interest and engagement from the boys side as well that they would want to know want to know more they have genuine questions to ask and uh, um yeah uh, so one group that we've not worked with are older men because that that we're still trying to figure out how do we get them into a conversation but we're really happy right now working with adults and boys and adults and girls we've engaged with older men in public setups where um, we participated in public events that have happened on the streets of uh, lucknow like there were happy streets and all being organized by hindustan times times of india so we sign up for events like that and we do games that encourage conversations in public and uh, in public games like these we've had the most number of men come to us and share questions that they've never had the space to ask be it about so so one of the most i'm sorry i'm just digressing a little bit but but this is one thing i really wanted to share because it makes a lot of sense in how a facilitator needs to think when when uh, we are working with individuals or groups of people so there was this person uh, who waited for an entire two and a half hour event to get over and then he uh, took us to the side and he wanted to discuss how he is stuck in this joint family setup where um, he has seen his sisters and his mother being made to sleep in a small room in a house they are rich people they stay in a big house so it's not like a dirty filthy stable that uh, the women were being put into but into a beautiful small little room so everyone knew that's a period room and how uh, his sisters a lot of time shared how embarrassing it was because of the whole idea of of keeping periods a secret is that no one gets to know of it everyone gets to know because you're sleeping in that room so how that makes them feel horrible and now that he's married and his uh, and they've just had a daughter he really does not want his wife to go through this humiliation and definitely not his daughter but the only reason he's unable to speak up for his wife and uh, to like to his mother is because he knows his sisters are not going to like it that you didn't speak up for us so there's this man who's stuck between relationships and this whole uh, uh, space that one should be given 
for maybe realizing things a little late or understanding things a little late, having the courage a little later. So this is also a conversation that we need to either have within our teams to understand our own mindsets better or our group's mindsets better, or if possible, to have these additional conversations with the groups that we are engaging with, that everyone needs to be given that space and given that time. Just because a mother has attended our workshop, she's not going to be the most supportive mother tomorrow. So how people need to get over that, so that that journey needs to be uh, specified, like stressed upon a lot. And people should be made comfortable to go ahead and take that journey and also feel comfortable that it's going to take time. No one is going to change overnight. So it's, yeah, that. No, I'd just like to add, uh, Kathy, uh, what Angana said, that it's so important that we show uh, and let the men and the boys see those menstrual products. Because, you know, they have never bought, they, they have never touched it before. So in a room where it's only men, they are seeing it and they actually know how it is to be used, what it looks like, how it feels. So, you know, they just thank us that, you know, to kind of, conduct a session where they're actually literally touching and seeing these products. Another thing that we do is also uh, during like recently for Valentine's Day, we make sure that we use social media where we say the men and boys can actually gift menstrual products to their girlfriends. For mm -hmm. Raki, they can gift them to their sisters. So we, you know, design these kits and we put them up and we tag and we have a lot of, I mean, we have some followers in our social media and, and it is picking up, uh, you know, equilibrium. So there are a lot of men who are ordering these and we, we ship them and, you know, they tell us that, you know, our girlfriends or, you know, the mother or Mother's Day and or Aki, that they just feel it's such a meaningful gift. And we then ask them to share the story in their uh, social media. And that's how, you know, it reaches out to a larger audience. And that is how men are then talking more about periods. So when one man, a man is talking, the, his friends uh, hear about it and then they get encouraged to do something like this. So I think we should pick up these days and you know, make use and you know, spread awareness and talk about periods. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Nelson. It's just striking me um, listening like to I'm gonna what you've shared and Nelson that so much of it's about providing opportunities, no? Like boys and men are really ready and often wanting to be allies, but just being able to have the space to go like how and what and, and when, and, and then, then things start happening. It's like permission, you're yeah. giving them the permission, that, that, but they are really eager. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just, and also I was laughing to myself. I'm like, imagine if men, and I was trying to think if they did, if they had a product or boys that was really secret that I never got to see and it was shrouded in mystery. Like you'd be so like, what is that? And you make up the weirdest stories in your head. And I actually can't think of an equivalent right now. I was like, condoms? I'm like, no, but girls know what condoms are like them because, but like, yeah. And so even these really kind of tactile, very practical things, you can't underestimate the benefit of it, no? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. This has just been so much fun. I'm just thinking, looking at the time, and I would like to open up for Q&A. Um, we've only got two participants left, but that's great. It means we can really go deep. So, <laughs> so, yeah, let's just open it up now and anybody can really just jump in with any, you know, additional thoughts, questions, best practices, suggestions. I know some of the participants are themselves somewhat experienced. So, yeah, it's your turn. <laughs> Just unmute yourself and speak. Uh, uh, hi, uh, I just have one question. Yeah, uh, what, are you, uh, what is the right age to uh, start uh, talking to boys about all this menstrual health and thing? Yeah, uh, girls, we start around like uh, 10 years or so. But what do you think is the right age to start this uh, topic with boys? You know, the young adolescent boys. Is there... Um, Again, yeah, I don't know uh, if a 10-year-old boy can uh, actually conceive uh, what the 10-year-old can, can, you know, uh, have thoughts about it. But, but how do you actually uh, start a topic with the adolescent boys? I think, uh, Subhalakshmi, I think with me, uh, we go with, uh, you know, boys that are aged 15, 16, when they're just plus 9, 10, because 
they've actually read in their syllabus, in their science biology, a little about this. Uh, a lot of government school students, uh, it's there in the chapter, but the teachers don't talk, talk and they don't teach that. They skip that chapter. Uh, but, you know, they read it because it's there in the syllabus, but they're not very sure. So I think uh, 15, 16 is a good enough time when, you know, they're ready to kind of get little information about this. Yeah, thank you, Nelson. Uh, and then one more thing. Um, when you talk to a group of women, you know, aged like from 30 to 50, uh, and then I've spoke with uh, certain parents to uh, get their children uh, to know about this topic. You know, it was uh, literally back in Pondicherry uh, where I live. Uh, but certain parents were too hesitant, like you said. They were like, no, my mother-in-law would not want my children to know about this. Um, this is a taboo topic as of now. We are not ready. See, because if in a, in a school environment, you need not get the uh, consent of parents. But when it comes to you going uh, up on certain houses and then picking up children to give a topic, there is always this uh, hesitation uh, from the parents where they're like, no, th they need not know this uh, right now. Maybe they will know it by themselves when they grow. So uh, it is a bit hard convincing the moms, you know, uh, and then they're scared of their mother-in-laws. Yeah, it is. It was, I went up straight to like um, four houses and then uh, three of them were like, no. And then there are obviously neighbors. They all, they all talk to everybody um, all the time. And they're like, no, this is not needed right now. Uh, we may think about this like um, three or four years later or they'll know it but my fear is that when they're all like around 10 11 12 year old girls okay so if they get to know about themselves there there are many chances like they'll get to know wrong information um or it'll be kept a secret or it'll come down the lane as their mothers and their grandmothers do so uh, how do you approach parents or when you get to households and then how do you like convince parents uh, can i respond to that um, so my limited experience in this regard has been that we need to understand that for a lay person who's not a menstrual educator, um, there is this fear of over-empowered girls and uh, posting Instagram pictures with pads as a fear in their head. So a lot of times, a lot of families, uh, parents and uh, school principals they have not been interested, not recently, not in the last couple of years, but say about three to four years back, a lot of principals thought that if we did a workshop with their girls, then by the next day, there are going to be pads stuck all over school with messages written in red. And feminist feminism is a very misunderstood, badly, badly misunderstood concept. And... Uh, like they were scared that the girls will become feminists and stick pads in, in the campus because of which they did not want to uh, ask, like allow us to come over. So I think what kind of worked for us in uh, situations like this is to package what we're talking about. Like we don't need to push periods outrightly as what we're here to do. Your girls need to talk about, understand periods because that's not something that a lot of parents would want to identify as a need. For their daughter so if if we start talking in terms of the context social context what's happening these days it's important for girls to know about their bodies so that they can be more empowered so that they can make make use of their education so i think reaching the point but not really using very direct words is what has helped us in certain uh, interactions like this, where the adults have not been comfortable. So wherever people are comfortable, we talk openly about why periods, why vagina, why penis, like not directly. Where it doesn't work, packaging is very, very important so that people are comfortable with what they are sending their uh, children for. Yeah, thanks, Anjali. I'd just like to add also uh, that, you know, uh, it's always best to do like in, in communities or with families like this, that we invite the mothers first. And, you know, have a very casual conversation with them. And then we give them a picture that, you know, the young adolescent girls, it's so important for them to know because maybe the mothers are almost nearing to uh, Minak. So, you know, now the younger ones should know. And when we talk to the mothers and say, hey, like you must have faced problems. So, you know, what are your period stories? But it takes time. It's not easy. But I think... Uh, with communities where they don't want the daughters to know, it's best that we do with the older ones first and then go into the younger ones. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nelson.
I think it's, I was just reflecting, I think it's really great that the word parent has come up so many times because that the longest teachers know. And if we, as you put it, I'm gonna this journey and the idea that it's long, because I think my understanding is the kind of dream for a period positive culture is that, you know, if a woman or a father or mother and auntie and uncles comfortable themselves, there is no kind of official age you have to wait for to start because when you live with your children, obviously, there's so many teachable moments far before they commence puberty. So if they see a pad lying around or if they see that you have to run to the bathroom or, and I know that if, if you were comfortable yourself, these are teachable moments because menstrual health education doesn't need to happen all at once in one education session with all the information. You know, it can be little bits and pieces along the way. So by, you just give what people are ready to maybe receive and it adds up to create a fuller picture and a story um, that's very normalized by the time you kind of put all the dots together. Um, yeah. I'm also thinking this is reflecting on um, like I have a son and so you know, if he sees a menstrual cup or a pad lying around or drying and that these are actually teachable moments. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. More questions. Or, or best practices or comments or wherever you want to go with it. <laughs> Kathy was saying, as you're all talking, I like how this is running everyone just going themselves. And so. I wanted to add one point in terms of best practices is uh, for an individual or for an organization who wants to work in their space, um, it is important to identify what about menstruation do they want to change? What is it that they want to impact? Of course, there could be some organizations who have the band bandwidth to impact maybe every aspect of menstruation, but otherwise, what do we want to do with it? And our entire messaging, our entire packaging of the curriculum, because the curriculum is, this act, the content is the same for all the organizations working on periods. Of course, wrong information is just, I'm not counting that, but otherwise it's biology, flow management, and uh, social positioning. Like that's that's the crux of what we do. Um, so like, for example, for Ecofem, like the kind of graphics that you have, you all about nature, natural, moon. You know, these are uh, images I identify with the period program that I understood about what Ecofem was delivering. And when we started talking about periods at Project Hill through our programs, uh, because again, Ecofem was the first uh, organization that I also met and was able to assist and saw their curriculum, I had that as what I kind of wanted to replicate. But that, that's not what I was completely, completely into. I liked it, but I wasn't able to deliver that because that's the, not where my connection was coming from. So I had to really dig deep in why did I want to work in this space and all the incidents from while I was growing up. And somehow it all connected into the entire attitude and the social aspect of things. So for the curriculum, uh, like when Harishini was explaining exactly what the flow of a session is, for maybe a day-long session, that's the flow. But I've also had days where in a day-long session also, we would have probably covered 50% of that because the intention of the organization and for me as an educator was attitude. So if I'm talking about biology and I do not see the girls open up and ease up to periods being something positive, I will not be able to move on to step two of the curriculum. So uh, having that kind of clarity, it really helps an organization and facilitators also to find what connects with them and then use that connection to boost the facilitation because the content is the same. But what we're choosing to say, how we're choosing to say, the examples that we're using, what kind of information are we okay if the if the group has got and okay if it is the, then it, we are okay if they've not got. So that kind of clarity is also important to be able to be effective while delivering a program like this. Um, yeah, it's an excellent point. And you're really speaking to um, the, the really kind of more, I think, intuitive soft skills sensitivity that one brings, you know, this, I mean, as you rightly say, in a way, the, the curriculum is not rocket science, there's some pretty much core elements, but there's so much more going on in the room, isn't there, that you have to sort of be able to sort of read and respond to, and context is everything, I find myself thinking that again and again, that, you know, it's, it's your setting, it's, you know, the background stories and conditioning that the people that you're speaking to have, it's, you know, 
it's also as a facilitator your own experience and that's something that we've often sort of do in training is to help anyone who's going into this work for the first time to really investigate and inquire from their own lived experience their own intimate relationship to menstruation but there's so many of those puzzle pieces parts you know that have to come together for the in content to land and even in the room there can be you know people at very different levels of a capacity to kind of relate to the content and I think that's all some of the challenges that the facilitator is facing and I'm really glad that this session that was my hope and I feel in many ways you know we're really harvesting the wisdom of each of you had so much experience that you're really naming some of these subtle aspects and not just sticking to the level of you teach this this and this but it's it's those deeper layers that I think is so important and where I think really is like the wisdom of your experience that I really hope to bring out through this session so I guess in the next 10 minutes if there's anything else like if you really just look inside and feel what is it that's really kind of crystallized into a jewel or a gem that you'd like to share I mean, quite selfishly, that's what I'd like to hear, but I think it will really help all of us on this call to just, you know, um, deepen the work that we're all doing in this space. Or maybe even if it's a story or an anecdote that illustrates something for you, maybe it's not yet a proven best practice that's a replicable thing, but something that you felt like was maybe an aha moment mm. that you'd like to kind of share. And um, you got surprised or, yes. or just, the, yeah. you know, yeah, it's so true. Like, because you you work in the field, there's, you know, you kind of have the stories, like my background's in social work, but you just remember, oh, with that client or when this happened, or like, there's just the little stories that stick in your head somehow. And that's yeah. always fun to hear too, to bring the work to life. So one of the sweetest things that happened, I think around 2016 or probably 17, like it's still one of the sweetest things that have happened is uh, we did a workshop on, uh, with boys on periods and um, one random girl like random girl she sent a message on uh, on our project hill page that i just heard that uh, you all did a workshop with boys today morning and some guy in her colony was part of that and how he went back home and he apologized because he always said stuff like you you are in one of your moods and it's one of those days and how she felt really grateful that a workshop on periods happened with boys I think that was really sweet because she didn't need it need to message us and she did because of something that she might have felt because this guy decided to act on what he learned so this is this this is one example like I quote every time why why we need to talk to boys because we don't even know the like how far the impact gets created like the ripple effects of impact goes on Thanks, that's really sweet to hear. <laughs> yeah, it is heartening. I, I can see Nelson and Hashini like going through the mental files, like which one? <laughs> I mean, it might not even be a feel good one. It might be one of those really key learnings. Yeah, like I, think I did things wrong and then you learn from that too. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about one, um, I was like uh, thinking, uh, like shuff, uh, shuffling between, do I tell a funny one or do I tell an emotional one? <laughs> so something that really moves me, um, like reminds me that um, why this work is important and uh, how powerful this work is like one statement that um, a girl told me after um, the workshop was over and I was almost like near my bike taking it uh, taking getting out of the school she ran and came and told me to like um, Akka like Akka is like six, uh, elder sister like uh, Akka you've uh, told something that uh, nobody has told me and I don't have a mother so I don't think anybody else would talk to me about this my I had my period my dad gave me a pad and uh, I, from then on, it's on. It's been like that, you know. So um, I just thought it was something that keeps me uh, really um, going, and uh, and uh, reminds that every training I give also, like I remind the facilitators that uh, you might be one of the first ones to speak about this top topic to them. Uh, always remember that you are in that uh, stage, you know, like uh, and, and that platform that you were the, one of the first ones. So. 
yeah <laughs> take that opportunity and uh, be grateful for that opportunity yeah, I think even with me, uh, you know, I just feel so privileged to be working in this space because of the journey I've had so far. And uh, I've met such amazing people uh, and I keep meeting so amazing people, especially I come across a lot of men and boys who say that, you know, uh, you are like an inspiration to us and you've made this conversation so easy for us to do in our families. So, you know, uh, Recently, I, uh, we did a program where, you know, uh, we're working, I, Kathy knows about this program that we're doing with uh, 30 young men in SM. It's called Project Manush, where we're working on gender, sexuality. And we did a special screening of a movie called Nut Cut, uh, where, you know, the lead act actor is Vidya Balan. And we had a live interaction with her on Zoom. And uh, when she heard about the work that I was doing, you know, she just encouraged and she said that, you know, we are doing such amazing work. She'd love to visit us someday. And, you know, so these little perks that we have in the journey when, you know, you just come across someone and who just is like, encourages you and fuels you up and just, you know, uh, because life isn't easy and we come across so many breakdowns and so many struggles, but uh, sometimes you, you meet someone who just, you know, gives that push and you're like, you're on track and that motivates you. And yeah, I think uh, a lot of sessions after we do, uh, the teachers especially, or in, in a corporate or wherever, they come and ask me, are you a doctor? Are you a gynecologist? They feel like I know so much more about women's bodies than they do. And then when teachers just say that, you know, you've done an amazing job, which I could not do to my students. So these are like really heart touching and uh, it just feels that probably uh, I'm doing something good and uh, I should keep doing it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Shay, you should keep doing it too. <laughs> I want, I want to share one uh, other thing uh, where this entire idea of giving people their time to have their journey uh, came. So uh, since last year, we've been working on this project on, um, uh, we've been running story circles with adolescent girls from UP and uh, mostly from the non-mainstream backgrounds. And uh, there was this one girl who was part of the first time that I used puppets and storytelling uh, to talk about periods back, I think around 2014 or 15. So she was, I've known her since 2012. She was there in the first workshop that I did on periods using storytelling. And then she's attended like four other workshops specifically around that and like 20,000 million little conversations around periods. And while we were discussing how periods affect romantic relationships and what their stories uh, with it, their experiences with it, this girl shared how she's not been able to hold her boyfriend's hand every time she is on her periods. And obviously we asked why. She said because she's scared that she'll get pregnant. And I was obviously zapped because I know this particular girl has got a lot of inputs around periods. She's been one of the more uh, contributing participants in all of these conversations. So I was completely zapped that where is this coming from? And all she said was that piece of information had reached me first. So it kind of stayed. So I know this does not happen. I know what we, like how people get pregnant, but I'll just take some time. It's been like five, six years. She's been sitting on that. And it is, I think it took, it took me a couple of days to actually understand that. Yes. When I say time, it could really mean 10, 15 years. And that's okay. Because somewhere at the back of her head, she also knows what the right information is. It is just that something else reached her first. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's extraordinary. I think, I, you know, I often feel this work is about just planting seeds, you know, sometimes we feel that pressure, like we've got this, you know, few hours, and it feels like there's so much to transmit, you know, and it might be the only kind of opportunity that, you know, we'll have as people are going in, especially in out of schools, maybe to, to get that across. But I, I love that. It's an, it really illustrates just how you know it's it's can be quite profound these stuff and to bring that information together maybe it's like information's one level but the actual internal kind of catching up with that information may take a lot longer and that's really okay i loved how you put it like the journey what was it oh yeah i wrote, wrote it down, down. <laughs> 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 giving people time to have that journey yeah i love that yeah. <laughs> we yeah. love that <laughs> yeah I, I, 
Yeah, I, I just have to agree. Like the sense I really have, like as we begin to wrap up is that, so the this session was about conducting a menstrual health education session, but the felt sense I think we all have is really that on this long journey, this menstrual session is like a tiny dot, you know, like geologic timeframes, because really what I feel from listening to you all is there's so much like, what are we walking into um, in terms of geography and facilities, but also culture and the, the actual physical space and that community, what are we walking into? The education session happens, but then from your care and hopes for change, there's also really that sense and what are we leaving behind? Like, are we giving advice that will be useful and practical? Is it supportive? Like, are we saying you should go see a doctor, but there isn't a doctor, like check these things. What are we leaving behind? And I really feel like it's the values we're talking about. It's cultural change and personal journeys and empowerment and informed choice. So it's so much bigger than this little menstrual health session, which is big in itself, but like it's in this full picture, the very full and complex mm. picture. Beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's absolutely unbeatable as closing comments. I'm very aware of the time. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank you all. Uh, I think it's been a super rich conversation, even the maybe hasn't been big in numbers of attending, but I've personally found it deeply rewarding just to hear from each of you and the quality of um, sharing your insights, your experiences. And I think it was just well summed up by Lauren that it's, it's powerful, um, it's powerful work that we're all doing. And this was the first session. I hope you'll be able to join for the future ones. We're gonna unpack, as you know, more of the kind of, perhaps some of the difficult aspects of this kind of work too, like around culture and taboo and how do we address this with sensitivity. Um, there's a topic that we're gonna unpack around um, there's, I mean, about talk period blood um, and, oh, yeah. and, and unpacking that. Yeah, period, like how yeah. do you do that? The idea that period blood's yeah. bad. I mean, even just talking about periods in a way that we don't sound um, products that we don't end up sounding fanatical because often we can feel that way <laughs> when we understand the environmental impact of disposables. But you know, there's a, a journey there for people as well. So that's what's coming up in the coming weeks. And we will again reach out to you all and our network to see if we can get some more people to harvest the um, learnings from this, these panels. Because I think this is actually just shows for me the richness of, of a learning community that, you know, we don't, anyone doesn't have all the answers. But together, if we start listening to each other, I think we can really all enrich and deepen Come our knowledge. Come up with a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um yeah if anybody wants to make any last very brief closing comments you don't have to otherwise um thank you anyone feel to say anything to close yes no thank okay. you everyone. well thank you very much again for giving your time and giving your knowledge your hearts to this work and to sharing it with all of us take care and look forward to seeing you all next week Bye-bye. <laughs> Grip wave. Bye. Bye. <laughs>